Thanks very much, Oliver. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this launch of issue two of the microfinance box dev lit. It's been almost two years since the first one of these was launched, the first microfinance box dev lit. And it's been really exciting to revisit the literature in what is a really uh, rapidly growing space. I want to start by thanking Oliver and everyone at CPR and Vox Dev Lit for their time and help on this. Um, I'm really excited to be joined today by Jing and Muhammad, the other editors. I appreciate all of their time. And let me also really thank and acknowledge our co-editors on this Vox Dev Lit, Erica, Cynthia, Jonathan, Jonathan, and Farah. So what we're going to do is we're going to give a brief overview today of the Vox Dev Lit. This is, of course, necessarily um, a brief summary. And if you're interested, there's a lot more detail, of course, in the piece itself. What I'm going to do is give a little bit of an introduction to what we're thinking of when we talk about microfinance today. Um, and then Jing is going to talk about the first generation of microfinance studies. Muhammad is going to talk about uh, this work in unpacking the classic microfinance contract. And then I'm going to talk about more recent work on microfinance institutions and conclude. So throughout this review, we're going to use the term microfinance to refer generally to provision of formal financial services to poor and low income individuals, and also to other people who might be systematically excluded from the financial system. Now, in doing so, we're gonna focus throughout here on microcredit, that's to say micro lending, but in doing so, we note that there are also other important forms of microfinance. So for example, micro saving, microinsurance and microequity. Those different forms are gonna be sitting in the background. They'll be relevant to some of the literature that we cite, uh, but frankly, there's a lot of scope for, uh, for other work and indeed a lot of other work that has already been done um, on these other forms of microfinance. It's worth acknowledging from the outset that microcredit is offered by a very wide variety of different institutional forms. These could be non-government organizations in the sense of charities, non-bank microfinance companies, microfinance banks, financial cooperatives, rural banks, and also some state-owned institutions. We're going to talk in more detail about some of the more recent organizational economics issues around microfinance institutions later. We're quite clear in this review that we're not focusing on lending services that are built on mobile money platforms, but that's clearly a really exciting area both for policy innovation and also for ongoing research, and we want to direct you right from the outset to the VoxDev lip on mobile money, which touches on some of these uh, adjacent issues. To fix ideas, it's worth thinking before we go further about the classic microcredit model. But the classic microcredit model, as I suspect we all know, typically incorporates the following features. And let me stress, typically incorporates the following features. We'll talk a lot today about variations on these themes. The first is group liability. So typically you would have self-selected groups with members jointly liable for loan repayment. The second, various forms of dynamic incentives in the sense that loans are gradually increased to reward good repayment behavior. Third, the use of frequent installments, which in some sense links closely to ideas of dynamic incentives in the sense that you have partial repayments of the loan as a disciplinary device for self-control. In many cases, although certainly not all, borrowers are encouraged to, to use loans for self-employment activities. This is something we'll come back to as we talk about the nuance between consumption lending and uh, investment lending. And finally, loans are often, although certainly not always, uh, targeted to women. So to take this further, uh, Jing will now talk about the first generation of microfinance studies, and then Muhammad will go on to talk about unpacking the classic contract that we've just set up. Over to you, Jing. Thank you, Simon. So in this first section, we're going to review studies that evaluate the impacts of microcredit programs whether microcredit affects different subsets of borrowers more than others, and the general equilibrium effects of microcredit programs. And the findings from these studies can provide evidence on whether microcredit is an effective development tool and offer policy implications for designing and targeting microcredit products. So firstly, I want to mention that it's actually challenging to identify the quotal impacts of microcredit because there can be selection biases on both the uh, demand and supply size. On the demand side, people who choose to borrow are likely to differ from numbers, including in terms of characteristics that cannot be directly observed or controlled for in the empirical analysis, such as borrowers' risk attitude or quality of their um, businesses or ideas. On the supply side, lenders may select certain regions or markets to enter and certain customers to approve. And those selection criteria are usually not so transparent 
to researchers. So these challenges have provided motivations for the large number of randomized evaluations for microcredit programs in recent years. And here we're going to review seven RCTs that evaluate microcredit products in a variety of contexts and um, countries. So as we can see from this table, uh, those studies cover microcredit expansion in seven different countries, including Bosnia, Ethiopia, India, uh, uh, Mexico, Mongolia, Morocco, and the Philippines. The studies take place in both rural and urban settings. And the average long-term ranges from about four months in Mexico to 16 months in Morocco. And the low interest rates were substantially lower than market interest rates in almost all those um, studies except for Mexico. The timing of follow-up surveys ranged from about one year to more than three years um, after the intervention. And if we compare um, those microcredit programs that are here with the classic uh, model, we can see that um, there are a lot of like uh, similarities. So first, among the seven RCTs, five are joint liability loans. And second, all loan programs offer dynamic incentives. And third, five of those seven studies encourage microenterprises um, uh, investment by either labeling their loans as business loans or requiring business proposals. The main difference from the classic model is that um, the classic model generally targets landlords and asset for uh, women, while only three studies here targeted women and only uh, the Mongolia and Ethiopia study explicitly targeted households below um, poverty structures. So the evaluation results um, suggest several main findings. First, although access to uh, microcredit leads to an increase in borrowing, business creation and investment, but most studies have found that this does not translate into increases in profit, income or consumption at least over the time horizon of one to three years post-intervention. There's also no robust evidence of gains in social indicators such as education and health. As a result, microcredit expansion only had modestly positive impacts on uh, beneficiaries with very little evidence of transformative effects. However, the evidence does suggest that microcredit is a powerful tool for changing occupation choices. For example, in Morocco, there was a um, significant increase in self-employment income, but no net impact on total labor income, because um, there's a loss in wage income, which was large enough to offset the gains in self-employment income. There's also evidence that access to microcredits improves risk management choices for households. For example, in the Philippines, there's evidence that microcredit was a preferred substitute for formal insurance as well as a complement to informal risk sharing. But there are some caveats that we need to keep in mind uh, regarding uh, those findings. First, in many studies, actually the magnitude of effects are not small, but they are not statistically significant. And this is due to a lack of statistical power because of the low take-up rates. So this means that while we cannot rule out their effects, we also cannot rule out large effects. So for future research, more precision is needed, maybe through larger sample size, better predictions of take up and meta-analysis. Second, since it is only feasible to randomize in places where microcredit is expanding into new markets or is expanding to new borrowers in existing locations, so those studies provide information or impacts on marginal or complier population of borrowers affected by the expansion and does not um, say about the impact on the long-term inframarginal uh, borrowers. And lastly, the RCT's uh, effects varies by um, social and cultural context. For example, a qualitative study shows that aversion to debt um, undermine microcredits in the Morocco study. And impact evaluations of a village bank project in China suggest actually much larger effects. And specifically, uh, access to microcredits uh, in, through the village bank in, in, in China increased income by uh, almost 46% and reduced poverty by 17%. And researchers um, think the, the findings are much larger there 
because the programs were targeted particularly um, poor regions and the villages started with far less access to formal finance than in the RCTs described here. And the microcredit contracts there charged very low interest rates and provided borrowers substantial time to invest before having to uh, repay. So although there's little evidence of transformative effects of microcredits on the average borrower, the impact can be heterogeneous across different types of borrowers. Specifically, many microfinance borrowers do not have any business and they are borrowing for consumption instead of for business investment. And this trip credit could also attract some marginal entrepreneurs with poor business skills to enter the market. And this could explain why the impact on business outcomes are limited. Another possibility is that the microcredit loans are too small to push any entrepreneurs out of the low status state. So testing heterogeneity can tell us whether there are some subgroups of borrowers benefiting more from microcredit, and this can help policymakers target promising borrowers and improve the overall welfare impact of lending. So some recent research has found two interesting types of heterogeneity. First, entrepreneurs who had started business operation before the microcredit expansion experienced significantly larger treatment effects than others. So one explanation for this heterogeneity is that because the cost of capital was higher prior to the introduction of microcredit, so those who select into entrepreneurship without microcredit may have business opportunities with relatively higher returns. Specifically, Banerjee et al. 2019 paper estimates that six years after the initial microcredit expansion in India, traded borrowers who had prior uh, business experience have 35% more assets and generate um, double the amount of revenue compared with the control um, uh, borrowers who also had prior business experience. And the treatment effects for other borrowers actually appears negative, which is driven not by the negative impacts on borrowers, but by the fact that microcredit led to the opening of more marginal and low profit businesses. So this suggests an important type of heterogeneity, um, heterogeneous impact of microcredit programs, which it has, um, it can indeed facilitate um, business growth for entrepreneurs with low wealth, but with some business talent. And another important factor to look at is gender. And many um, microcredit programs focus on female entrepreneurs. So um, it's interesting to test whether such programs actually generate larger impacts for, for women. Using a randomized experiment in Uganda, uh, Fela 2018 randomly offered credit or business training on both male and female entrepreneurs and finds large effects on profit and sales for male-owned enterprises that were offered loans, while neither treatment has any effect on female entrepreneurs. So the results that indicate that the credit constraint men, which is a sample that is which are not targeted by traditional microcredit lenders can actually benefit substantially um, from such programs. So the next question is why the impact is lower on women. Some follow-up studies suggest that this is because women usually face considerable restrictions on how they can use capital. And in many contexts, women's capital is invested into their husband's enterprises. So this suggests that female empowerment interventions can potentially improve the impact of microcredit programs on women. So in general, more work is needed to fully explore the heterogeneity um, uh, of microcredit programs. For example, Major 2019 provides suggestive evidence that the microcredit impact varies by features of loan contracts, such as interest rates and loan size. And as a result, future work to identify the causal effects of household experiences and long contract terms on uh, microcredit impact could be um, permissible. Lastly, um, where the impact of uh, microcredit on direct beneficiaries are well understood, very few studies have um, uh, tackled the general equivalent or GE effects of microcredit programs. And microcredit programs might have um, multiply effects through different uh, types of channels. So first, if the 
impact of microcredits on business outcomes increase over time, microcredits may stimulate firm investment and demand for labor. And this may further lead to reductions in savings and higher interest rates, affecting the entry of new firms and the aggregate capital uh, stock, and thus placing upward pressure on wage. Second, microcredits may increase aggregate demand because many borrowers use microcredits as a consumption loan. Moreover, microcredit access may also cause um, households to reduce precautionary saving and increase consumption. However, it's challenging to estimate the GE effects because it requires market level variations in access to credit. Or in other words, it needs a quantitatively large and exogenous shock to credit supply. And it also needs the shock to play out at the level of the entire um, labor market. So a recent wave of papers tried to fill in this gap by using quasi-experiments and uh, randomized control trials to measure the GE effect of microcredit. For example, Kabaski and Townsend um, 2012 paper found that Thailand's million uh, village fund program, which injected more than um, 25,000 US dollars into villages for lending, has big impacts on consumption and wages. Think at all 2020 carried out a study in Zambia and showed that access to lean season credits increased consumption and uh, village level wages. And similarly, Berg et al. 2019 shows that providing access to credit um, to farmers in Kenya during harvest time affects local prices through helping farmers delay grain sales. And in a, re in a recent paper, Brada and Kinnan 2020 studied a major lending shock in India during which more than uh, 1 billion US dollars in credit was wiped out. And they find that the large, um, uh, this large uh, negative credit shock significantly decreased daily wages, uh, household wage earning, and also consumption. But one issue of those studies is that it's hard to evaluate the macroeconomic effects of um, economy-wide microcredit using existing data. So in another recent paper, Burr et al. 2020 studied the short-run and long-run aggregate um, impacts of microcredit using a model of entrepreneurship and financial frictions. The others use the models to um, uh, simulate and to quantify microcredit impacts on several key uh, macro measures of development, uh, including output, capital, TFP, wages, and interest, uh, interest rate. So they find that the general equilibrium effects differ substantially from the partial equilibrium effects. In partial equilibrium, microcredit increases income and capital because it allows more people to invest, but it lowers TFP because of the entry of low productivity uh, entrepreneurs. In general equilibrium, both wages and interest rates increases in the short run because of the rising demand for capital driven by microcredit. In the long run, the provision of microcredits lowers saving and the interest rate rises. This together with higher wages lead to only a small increase in the number of entrepreneurs. However, the average um, quality of entrepreneurs and the efficiency of capital allocation both improve. Consequently, the higher capital and lower TFP offset each other in the longer term, leading to a small impact of microcredit on output. But although the long run GE factor is small, the vast majority of the population does benefit from microcredit and the welfare gain is larger for the poor and marginal entrepreneurs. So in the next uh, um, section, um, Mohamed is going to um, discuss some recent literature that seeks to unpack some of the most important and distinct features of the classic microcredit model. Thank you very much, Jing. Um, so as Jing mentioned, we're going to now try and unpack some of the classic, uh, the, uh, some of the elements of the classic microcredit model. Now, often one of the most distinctive features is this group lending model, which is um, unique, really. And within the group lending, the most prominent feature is joint liability. So loans are given to individuals, but there is joint liability within a group. So there is a consequence to somebody else in your group not repaying the loan. Now, there's an extensive theoretical literature 
which shows the benefits of joint liability uh, lending in terms of uh, reducing adverse selection and moral hazard through peer screening, monitoring, and enforcement mechanisms. We also have some experimental evidence. Uh, we have a paper by uh, Gina and Carlin and also by Atanasio, Augsburg, De Haas, uh, Fitzmans, and Hagmart, and which shows that basically when the bank moves away from joint liability to individual liability, we don't necessarily get uh, uh, worse repayment outcomes. We don't necessarily see an increase in default. So how do we reconcile the kind of theoretical literature which shows the benefits of joint liability group lending with the experimental evidence which suggests that the, the joint liability element did not necessarily lead to better repayments compared to individual liability? Well, although many banks have moved away from offering uh, joint liability and towards individual liability, they've retained many elements of the group lending model. Um, so this includes uh, public repayments, group meetings, and so the bank is still able to leverage social capital to uh, ensure good repayments. And so there's an element of peer pressure without necessarily having uh, legal pressure. And so now we'll talk about a few more of the features that the banks have retained um, in the classic uh, model while removing joint liability. So we mentioned uh, dynamic incentives at the beginning. So dynamic incentives are also very important. Um, this refers to the process of incremental lending. So you start off by taking a smaller loan, if you repay your loan, uh, you may receive uh, better terms on your new loan, but typically you would get a larger loan for your next loan. And so this has been found to be quite an important uh, aspect of the microfinance model. And again, we have an extensive theoretical literature which shows the benefit of uh, dynamic incentives for ensuring high repayment rates. And we supplement that with experimental evidence, both from kind of lab in the field type of experiments, such as this paper by uh, Gine, uh, Jaquela, Carlin, and Modak, where they uh, work with Peruvian micro entrepreneurs and they show that dynamic incentives really can help in terms of reducing the default rate. We also had field experience, uh, experiment uh, evidence from Gine, uh, Goldberg, and Yang, um, an experiment in Malawi where they implement a fingerprint identification technology. You can think of this as acting a little bit like a credit bureau would do. It allows people uh, to be identified and helps with the dynamic incentive. And so this led to better repayment rates and also uh, reduced both adverse selection and moral hazard. And we also have uh, experiment evidence from South Africa, which is more of a uh, consumer credit experiment, but similarly shows the benefits of dynamic incentives in terms of better repayment outcomes for uh, microcredit. Now, just one thing to mention is that the power or the benefit of um, dynamic incentives uh, could be really uh, reduced a lot if there's a huge expansion of microfinance with lots of institutions and, and greater competition. It could really blunt the benefits of dynamic incentives. So the next thing to talk about is repayment flexibility or to begin with inflexibility. In the standard model, um, typically, clients are required to repay at very uh, high frequency, uh, regular uh, periods. And so often they have to start repaying the loan almost immediately after receiving it, maybe two weeks or a month later. Now, you can think of reasons why the lender may like this kind of arrangement. Um, they get to see the borrower on a regular occasion. Um, this kind of uh, rigidity uh, perhaps helps with repayment rates. But it may not really be the optimal thing for some types of borrowers. Some of them may have riskier investments, which uh, could take time to bear fruit. And so having to repay immediately after receiving the loan may not be optimal. And so we can think of uh, a couple of ways that uh, flexibility could be helpful for borrowers. Um, one of them acts through the, as a, through the credit constraint channel. Um, if you give people some time, additional time to repay the loan, then perhaps they're able to invest in larger amounts, lumpy investment or uh, say a large machine for their for their business. They could also op operate through a different channel, almost like an insurance like element, which is, you know, throughout the period of the loan, if they're facing shocks, they're able to take a break from making payments for their loan. So it, it, it could impact in these two different ways. Now, the kind of seminal work in this space is paper by Field, Pandey, Pap, and Rigol, um, an experiment in India where they implemented, uh, they took the standard contract and they introduced a grace period, which is basically a two-month period at the beginning of the loan where the clients did not have to make any uh, repayments. And so they found that this was very beneficial for the clients. Um, they invested more in lumpy investments, machines, et cetera. 
um, and they increased their profits. However, it did lead to greater defaults for the microfinance institution. And so there's uh, extensive work which builds on this with novel innovations on, on flexible contracts. Um, so this paper by uh, Batalia, Guleshi, and Madista have an interesting variation on a grace period contract. They allow it to be exercised at any point during the loan. So at any point, the client can say, okay, I need to take a break from my repayments. And so um, what they find is that the implicit insurance element is quite important. People use the uh, grace period throughout the contract, not just at the beginning of the contract. And so it's almost like an insurance benefit. And they also find improvements in terms of uh, repayments. Uh, Balboni and Agawal also have an interesting um, innovation in this space in that they offer a flexible contract. They offer clients in their treatment group a choice between a flexible contract and a fixed contract, a more rigid contract. And interestingly, they have a greater price for the flexible contract. And there's an idea in the paper that a uh, higher price may lead to positive selection. So certain types of borrowers may be willing to pay that extra amount for flexibility. And they do indeed find benefits um, for individuals who offer the flexible loan, um, in both in terms of better outcomes for their business, but also um, improved repayment outcomes, so positive selection. Now, you know, you may come away from this thinking, okay, we should just offer flexible contracts to everybody. Um, a very recent paper by uh, Brune, Gine, and Carlin provides uh, contrasting evidence and a, a note of caution. They implement a field experiment in Colombia where they offer flexible loans to first-time borrowers. Now, this is different to the previous papers that I mentioned, which are basically offering it to graduated borrowers. So individuals have already uh, borrowed under fixed kind of rigid repayment structure, and then you offer them flexibility. Now, in this experiment, they offer flexibility to first-time borrowers. And why would you want to do that? Well, there may be a large potential group of clients who are financially excluded because they would never take a loan under a very rigid contract. So by providing flexibility from the beginning, you could financially include a large number of individuals. However, they do not really find much evidence of this at all. They do not find evidence that once you offer flexibility for first-time borrowers, you get this big pool of clients who otherwise wouldn't borrow. And they also do find greater defaults for flexible repayment clients. So this very much aligns with evidence from established microlender practice, which is that they don't offer flexibility um, to first-time borrowers. And so clearly we see that there's a trade-off in terms of uh, contract design. Flexibility may be beneficial for some type of borrowers, but you can think for other borrowers, this fixed fiscal discipline from having a rigid repayment structure may actually be beneficial. Um, indeed, it may help some people in terms of instilling discipline and, and saving up um, for, for some other uh, lumpy investment or uh, because of its implicit commitment value. And so the question of uh, which innovations does one offer and uh, who, who do we offer those to is really an important area of ongoing microfinance research. Another thing that's quite important is the timing of the loan. Like when does the loan get dispersed and when 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 do you ask for repayments, which links to the previous point, but uh, a subtle difference. As mentioned in the classic microcredit uh, micro model, often people have to repay um, almost immediately after receiving the loan um, before any investment has really uh, borne fruit. And so it really favors individuals who already have a diversified and, and, and a diversified income stream, and they can use that income stream to pay for the loan two weeks after receiving it. And so this may not be appropriate for individuals who have income maybe only one or two points in a year, such as individuals in agriculture. And so this experiment in Kenya by Burke, uh, Berkvist and Miguel um, show really the importance of timing. So they show that farmers who um, uh, are producing grain they often, uh, grain prices are fluctuating throughout the year, and they often have having to um, sell their grain at low prices and buy their grain at high prices, which is like the opposite of what we usually talk about in of arbitrage and finance. Um, you usually want to buy, buy low, sell high. And so they find that because farmers don't have access to credit, they're often having to sell their, their grain at the worst time in terms of prices to pay for school fees and other obligations, and then having to, to buy it back at higher prices. But once they offer them credit, they're able to um, improve outcomes for themselves. So there's an important other work here on um, the liquidity constraints, seasonality, and credit timing. Finally, just wanted to talk about asset-based microfinance a little bit. 
So we already have a very uh, established body of literature which shows that providing appropriate fixed assets to micro enterprises um, can lead to high and sustained returns. And we see this both with urban micro enterprises, but also asset transfers in uh, rural agricultural settings. The question for policy really is, it's, it's obviously very expensive to just provide people with assets. Um, it can often cost thousands of dollars. The question is, can one use credit contracts to recover some of the capital, to recover the capital which allows it to be redeployed? So this is an exciting area of the microfinance literature now, which is asset-based microfinance. So we have this uh, paper by uh, Jack, Suri, uh, Kramer, and Delat uh, in Kenya, where they work with a cooperative. And the in the standard uh, loan product that they uh, implement, in the standard loan product that they work with, borrowers usually have to provide a third of the value of the loan as collateral and two thirds um, via guarantors. Now, they implement an innovation or a different contract where the asset itself can be used as collateral for the loan or 96% of the value of the loan. And when they offer this uh, new contract, they find significantly uh, greater take up um, from borrowers and much improved outcomes. Um, in Pakistan, Bari and co-authors uh, provide evidence from an asset-based loan as well, which again, the, the asset serves as collateral for the loan. And this also allows the lender to, uh, to lend four times as much as the standard loan size. And it leads to large and sustained improvements for uh, the micro enterprises and also for household outcomes. So we think a very interesting area for research, uh, for lenders and policymakers is to think about um, innovative alternatives uh, for collateralization. And so this paper by um, uh, Gertler, Green and Wolfram, um, they, they explore something called digital collateralization. So this idea of uh, find, uh, of, of an asset potentially being locked if uh, there are non-repayments. And so this can clearly help improve credit risk management for microfinance institutions. Um, and they do find in this paper that it leads to much better repayments. Um, and so this can improve in terms of implementation of asset-based microfinance, but policymakers obviously need to be aware of the potential hardships that defaulting borrowers can face. And so this is uh, considered by the authors in their paper, and they have a theoretical model which suggests that some intermediate degree of lockout may be uh, welfare maximizing. So I now turn it back to Simon to talk about microfinance institutions. Thanks very much, uh, Mohammed. So the last section, we're going to talk about microfinance institutions. And I must say on a personal level, I've found this a really fascinating thing, thing to learn more about. I, I tend to think that when we talk about microfinance, for very good reasons, there's a very natural inclination to want to talk about the borrower side and the consequences for the borrower side. The microfinance institutions, I think, are important for two key reasons. One is thinking about what the microfinance institution's own financial situation looks like and the extent to which it is or isn't profitable to lend, um, which is important for thinking overall about the gains or otherwise from microfinance. And second, I think there's clearly organizational issues within microfinance institutions that lead to certain kinds of loans being given, certain kinds of loans being more viable, for example, than others. So let me briefly speak about those two lines of research. So first, descriptively, Cull and co-authors in 2018 go and find quite remarkable data from about 1,300 microfinance institutions, which jointly serve about 80 million borrowers. And this enables a really wide description of the operations from a financial perspective um, of a large number of important lenders. There's a couple of key findings there that I think are generalizable in a lot of contexts here. First, they find that the costs of making small loans to poorer clients are high. And that shouldn't surprise us, but it's clearly an important stylized fact that sits in the background of the underlying motivation for microfinance. And a question that probably all of us get in seminars when we present on this topic, which is, why don't we see more lending of this kind from formal banks? Second, they find that subsidies are often necessary in order to deliver services in situations where revenues don't cover costs. So the median institution in this context is receiving five cents of subsidy per dollar lent, and this is amounting to 51 US dollars of subsidy per borrower. And this is a highly skewed uh, distribution as well. And this is really important for the overall, one of the key conclusions of Cull and co-authors, which is that we 
should probably move away from a narrative that subsidies are just a short run or uh, introductory thing for a microfinance institution to need. That, that, that subsidies in this space are likely to remain a very persistent feature of microfinance provision, at least for a large number of borrowers. And the authors therefore encourage uh, a transparent conversation about the use of subsidies. What's the purpose of subsidies? Um, the distinction between, for example, subsidies for consumption lending versus subsidies for investment lending, which potentially have very different kinds of justifications um, in this space. So let's switch over then to think about the organizational uh, aspects within microfinance institutions. And, and typically the literature here, very exciting recent literature that typically has touched on two different themes. One is the actual incentive contracts for loan officers. But lurking in the background, of course, is discussion about the information structure. In other words, what is there to know about microfinance borrowers and who is best placed to know it? So one very exciting recent paper in this space is the work of Rigol and Roth, who run a field experiment with a large Chilean lender. And this is designed to test essentially how organizational incentives for loan officers can affect graduation of promising borrowers. Now, there's an interesting status quo that Rigol and Roth study here, and this will be true for some but not all microfinance institutions, of course. But in this context, loan officers could endorse lenders who would then move to a graduation portfolio, but those lenders would then, those uh, lenders, sorry, could endorse borrowers, excuse me, to move to the graduation portfolio, but those borrowers, those clients, would then move out of the portfolio of those individual loan officers, who would then risk losing compensation because their compensation scheme was tied in part to the performance of their own individual loan portfolios. So the authors tested two variations in loan officer contracts. First, they introduced a mitigation arm. It was a very elegant design in which the graduated borrowers were counted as if they still remained in the portfolio of the, uh, the earlier loan officer. And second, mitigation plus recognition. And this added rewards if graduated borrowers then subsequently performed well. Now, I won't unpack that today. That's all discussed in the paper. But as a headline result, the combined effect of this mitigation plus recognition was to increase by about a third the net present value of graduation loans to endorse borrowers. I think this is a really nice paper because it gives a very crisp indication that the individual uh, contracts that are offered to loan officers by the microfinance institution themselves have very important implications um, for the extent to which the institution as a whole is willing to uh, encourage individual borrowers to graduate and therefore has very important implications for the overall profitability um, of the microfinance portfolio. I think this is probably a result that doesn't surprise anybody who has worked with microfinance institutions and who has seen up close some of the incentive issues that loan officers do and don't face. But I think it's a really exciting area of research um, in, in which to pursue. This relates then to the issue of local knowledge and high return micro enterprises. And there's several recent really exciting papers in this space. First, by Hussam Rigol and Roth in 2010, there's a notion of using community screening for productive borrowers. Now, in this case, it's not explicitly a microfinance paper, but we're clearly thinking about returns to capital among micro enterprises and local knowledge about that return to capital, which is directly relevant for thinking about a lot of microfinance contracting issues. So in this case, the authors asked local entrepreneurs to rank their peers' profitability and their growth potential. And they did, with that, did that with some incentive compatible mechanism, which we won't discuss today. Um, but then they randomly distributed cash grants and they were able to look at the return to those cash grants and compare them um, based on the ranking that was received from the local entrepreneurs. They found that community members' rankings were highly predictive of the marginal returns to capital. Interestingly, particularly in the day and age in which we live, this actually substantially outperformed a machine learning tool, which is to say that even if you have a vector of relevant information about an enterprise, sometimes you can't do nearly as well as the um, less tangible information that might be held by community members. This is one indication that people who are much closer to the micro enterprises themselves, in this case, community members, but perhaps also um, the, the loan officers, can often have much better information um, than others might have. This relates to more recent work by uh, Garrett Bryan uh, and co-authors, Adam Osman and Dean Carlin, who ran a very exciting experiment in Egypt in which they doubled the loan size in a control group and then quadrupled the loan size with an increased repayment period in a treatment group. So it's a paper in part about what happens if you increase loan sizes. But what becomes really exciting for this discussion here is the results about heterogeneity. 
because the authors find, as they put it, mostly null average impacts of these larger loans. However, using recent machine learning methods, particularly the Chernozukov et al. method, they then find important heterogeneity among borrowers, which then has implications for misallocation of lending by the microfinance institution. Now, importantly, and resonating with the earlier work of Hussam et al., this heterogeneity is discovered only when the authors include uh, psychometric and cognitive data, which is to say you can run this very sophisticated machine learning algorithm using standard demographic and business performance data, but that does not do a particularly good job at uncovering the heterogeneity that you will see in the effects of microloans. But when including a battery of psychometric and cognitive data collected at baseline, then you start to see very interesting heterogeneity. I think that's interesting because one could certainly imagine microfinance institutions trying to collect that kind of data, and some do, but it also speaks about, I think, the importance of the kind of information that we might know on a personal or local level, but might be much harder to collect and aggregate at an institutional level. Finally, this relates to a slightly earlier paper by Pushka Mitra and co-authors, who hypothesize along similar lines that I've discussed, that microfinance institutions might be unable to successfully screen out unproductive borrowers and this might have implications not only for the average treatment effects that we've all discussed earlier, but also overall implications for the performance of the microfinance institution. So these authors propose a trader agent intermediated lending or trail. And in this context, the microfinance institution is actually delegating the selection of borrowers to an agent who is chosen from informal traders and lenders in the community. So you can see the close resonance of ideas here to the two papers that I discussed previously. And in this case, trail agents actually receive quite a lucrative commission, a commission of 75% of the interest paid by the borrowers whom they recommend. And the authors find that this caused about a 27% increase in production of the main cash crop in an agricultural setting and a 22% increase in farmer incomes. So again, a suggestion that there's important local knowledge that might be difficult for a uh, microfinance institution to aggregate um, at the overall institutional level, but knowledge that can be accessed through clever design of contracts for the loan officers themselves. I think this is a very exciting area and one that will, I hope in future, continue to sort of parallel the discussion that we have about microfinance borrowers, because it really thinks about the implementability um, of, of a lot of the very interesting innovations that we've discussed. So let me just for the final couple of minutes, um, take you through five key conclusions that uh, we have drawn uh, in the Voxdev lit, and then I think that that hopefully makes it a nice place to, to start some discussion. So five key lessons. First, that the traditional model of microcredit does not have transformative effects on its borrower pool. However, as we've heard, this kind of contract might be valued for liquidity, might be valued for implicit insurance, and also some subgroups may find this contract valuable. Second, for many clients, a key attraction of microcredit is the opportunity to accumulate a lump sum. And so if we're talking about the kind of borrowers who are very keen to accumulate a lump sum, most obviously, for example, for lumpy uh, business investment, then grace periods are therefore likely to be valuable in many contexts. Further, for graduated borrowers, microfinance may be too micro, quote unquote. That's to say there may be exciting possibilities for strongly backing borrowers who have showed that they are capable of repaying loans and who have profitable investment opportunities. And Mohammed has already talked about asset-based finance as one model in which we might be able to talk about strongly backing such borrowers in future. Third, it remains an open research question how microcredit can retain its basic advantages while being more flexible and tailored. And this, of course, is a theme that comes from several of the studies and Mohammed talked about in recent Brun et al. paper. On the one hand, it seems that there is great advantages of increased flexibility for some borrowers, but clearly there are also very strong reasons that microfinance institutions have designed the classic model as they have done. And that clearly remains an open research question um, requiring uh, further testing. Fourth, microcredit contracts must often be understood in the contract context of intra-household pressures. So contracts that allow clients greater autonomy over the use of the lump sum, and in particular contracts that are designed for women, may prove particularly beneficial for this reason. And finally, a point that is surely obvious, but nonetheless, I think is worth repeating in this space, is that different microcredit contracts have different uses for different borrowers. So 
as the literature progresses, I suspect that it's more and more likely that we're going to stop talking about microcredit in the abstract and start talking more and more about nuanced contracts that are designed for different kinds of borrowers and different kinds of investment or indeed consumption needs. In particular, microcredit, in some cases, is designed to support business expansion. In other contexts, a lot goes into consumption. We might wonder more and more in future whether the same kind of contract is really the right way of trying to serve those different purposes. And indeed, as I flagged earlier, there might be very different justifications or not for subsidizing microfinance institutions for those different kinds of contracts. So that summarizes uh, issue two of our VoxDev list. Uh, we hope it provides a useful overview of where the literature is up to. Of course, as with any review, I'm sure that there are papers that have been left out. Um, we look forward to hearing from people, look forward to our discussion, um, and look forward at some point in future to the Vox Dev Lit issue three. Thank you all. And I guess it's over to you, Oliver, um, to chair the question. Thank you very much um, to all of you. That was incredibly um, insightful and interesting presentation. So we've had a couple of questions through, and I'm sure we'll get some more as we move into the discussion. Um, so one is on, I'll, I'll pose both of them and then I'll let um, whoever wants to come in, come in. Um, so we've had one about um, microfinance saturation in markets and whether um, there's areas now where there is limited room for kind of expanding micro um, credit more, or if there tends to be across the board room to expand these types of programs. And um, from Joe as well, there's another question about whether there's a pathway for graduated borrowers to move to borrowing from formal banks um, once they've kind of borrowed from microfinance institutions and whether that's something that's been explored at all. So I uh, will start with those two and then we've had another question through which we'll get to after. Um, thank you, Oliver. Um, thank you, Joe, for the question. I'll take the first question on saturation. I mean, ultimately, that'll be for regulators to really to look at, but I just wanted to flag that in the lit, we do have some uh, papers which really look at the impact of uh, increased competition. And so there, there are some nice lessons in that. I mean, there's uh, work by McIntosh and Wydick, which show um, evidence that competition can really exacerbate asymmetric information problems over uh, borrower indebtedness and particularly affecting the, the poorest uh, borrowers the most. And um, there's also work by um, uh, Makitosh again and, and Dejanri and Sadele looking at uh, competition in Uganda. Um, and so there's important work to be done in terms of like developing credit bureaus and trying to um, at least be able to monitor how indebted people are so regulators can have a better handle on this. Yeah, I just want to add one more thing to the, sorry. Um, yeah, I just want to add one more thing to the first question. Um, so I guess uh, in many cases, there's definitely uh, room to expand the programs, but given the, what we have shared um, um, before that, the overall impact seems to be limited and some groups benefit more from the program. So I guess the more important question is like, not about endless expanding to more areas and reach out to more people, um, but to like, how, how can we make such programs more uh, effective? by targeting or by like um, uh, uh, finding out novel ways to um, to kind of um, design the contrast to make it tailored to diff uh, people with different needs or demands. Right, thank you. Um, so then we have a question from um, Paddy, which is quite long, but I'll try and summarize it as succinctly as possible, um, which is basically saying that, um, so kind of outside of mainstream academic economics, um, often when you read about microfinance in the news or um, in articles, there's often these kind of alarming or uh, kind of horror stories about um, kind of focusing on the very negative effects that occur for certain borrowers and bearing that in mind, it becomes quite hard for policymakers um, who read these accounts, these horror stories to endorse microfinance or um, use it as a policy when people become aware of these very small um, kind of concentrated, extremely negative effects. Um, and he basically asks, um, 
how these social harms might be captured in the data that is used by these studies and um, if this is kind of something that is included when you talk about heterogeneous effects um, so yeah maybe addressing kind of or even thinking about how these extreme negative effects are maybe captured in studies or how they can be addressed moving forward um, yeah hopefully I'll summarize that question all right thanks let, let me jump in briefly on this and let me say hi Patty and thank you for the question I'm not going to have a great answer to this but but I'll say I, I highlight two things first heterogeneity in stories and second heterogeneity in lenders so heterogeneity in stories I mean I've certainly heard horror stories of the kind that you describe I've also been in situations where you know a micro lender will, will stand up and give a presentation and say 99% of our clients said that our product was wonderful um, which is to say that obviously on both extremes you can have uh, both horror stories and also wonder stories um, about individuals who claim that microfinance has been transformative I guess the challenge for the policy community, and Patty, you obviously know this, this space a lot better than I do, is how to move the discussion to a discussion about aggregation, exactly back to the point that Jing started with, that where we have large data sets and also uh, you know, hierarchical analysis that thinks about trying to combine multiple data sets from multiple studies, hopefully we can have a serious uh, conversation in a policy space about average effects and then heterogeneity within that so that we're not driven by either end of the distribution. Although I completely take your point that sometimes it's either end of the distribution um, that, that ends up dominating in practice. On the point about microfinance institutions, I mean, I think that's a really good point. And, and again, there's probably no great answer here. There's a number of different institutions that will operate in different ways and we end up aggregating across them. And Jing, of course, talked about, for example, differences in interest rates, even across those set, uh, seven studies uh, summarized by Rachel Meager. But I guess in some respects, if we're really talking about predatory lenders or lenders engaging in unlawful behavior or you know unlawful pressure on clients who um, are defaulting and so on, in some respects, it mirrors some discussion that you might have in this country that we tend not to, we blame high street banks for a lot, but we tend not to blame high street banks because of something that we you know see happening in a you know a sort of unregulated lender. Um, or you know, pawn shop or this kind of organization. And I guess it's about the nuance with which we can talk about lenders or talk about microfinance institutions. I suspect I haven't really answered your question except to agree that I think it's uh, it's a difficult space in which to have that policy discussion, particularly when, as you imply, the label microfinance or microfinance institution can be seen as encompassing such a very broad range of lenders and also borrowers. I agree with everything that's been said, but just to add, I mean, Jing in her slide, she had some caveats when looking at those kind of uh, impact evaluations. And one of the caveats is that they were implemented with banks who potentially were operating on, on marginal clients and with, you know, they were willing to work with researchers, which could be different to other microfinance institutions who, um, yeah. Now, uh, we didn't also, uh, I think there was a, a question by Joe on graduated borrowers. Um, I don't think we really touched on that, but I mean, Simon touched on that a little bit when you're talking about the uh, Rigol and Roth paper and, um, you know, many microfinance institutions seem to um, have a standardized product that they offer, which is, you know, has a, often has a, a cap, a borrowing cap, and that many people often talk about this missing middle, right? So you have uh, more uh, larger banks, which cater to certain individuals and, and, and microfinance institutions will often offer smaller amounts. And so there is often people talk about this mid, uh, missing middle. And also another thing that I forgot to mention on, on the lending, um, on the increase in competition, there's important uh, work being done on digital lending and the potential for that to be to lead to indebtedness. And that also links to a question by Wycliffe about uh, mobile money and the risk of not disclosed, disclosed borrowing. So I wanted to flag that in the Fox Dev Lit on mobile money, there's a good section on digital lending because there are studies there which show that um, rapid increase in digital credit can lead to um, some decreases in welfare for some borrowers. Great, thank you. Um, and then I think one last question that we have time for from um, Raja talks about or asks about um, the transparency behind um, the subsidies that certain microfinance institutions receive and um, just thinking about is 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 the difficulties in lending to kind of these poor uh, um, borrowers is that what's driving these high levels of interest rates um, and yeah just thinking about how um, 
the role of subsidies and yeah i guess just opening up if if you have any more points on that Well, I'll have a go. I mean, not really. I think it's a really good point. And I think it's something that comes out of the Carl and co-authors paper that these subsidies are there, but it's often something that is difficult to know easily or know in a public space. And in some respects, it links back to Patty's discussion about the difficulty of public debate in this space, because obviously, if you've got a microfinance bank um, lending, that could be a very different experience, for example, to an NGO that's lending. One of them might be much more explicit about the extent to which it does or doesn't receive subsidies. So I don't have solutions uh, on this point, but I agree that it's it's, it's a good one and uh, and well made. I mean, I think as researchers as well, we're increasingly um, seeing research. I mean, if you, if you look at the papers on, say, asset transfers, um, they often find very large effects and very persistent effects. And so if you look at just the benefits compared to the microcredit literature, often microcredit literature finds uh, smaller average effects, right? But the capital is being returned mostly in those microcredit literature. So often researchers now are doing more detailed cost benefit analysis at the end of the at the end of the project, at the end of the research, just to provide a little bit more transparency for policymakers who are choosing between different a portfolio of different um, programs. I think there's a question by Salman as well, just to mention that we've really focused on microcredit here um lending um, and as simon mentioned in the beginning there could be other things that were within the broad term of microfinance which could be uh, micro insurance micro savings micro equity so potentially something more akin to the business partnerships that you mentioned but um maybe for a future edition one day great thank you all so much um for the presentation and then also for the discussion afterwards i think we're gonna um end things there